Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For those space fans who have been living under a rock, SpaceX flew its Starship in super heavy stack for the second time today. They took off just after dawn in Texas, anticipating that if Starship succeeded, it would travel around the world and land in Hawaii just before sunrise. And right away, everything went better than the first flight. The deluge system protected the pad and we did not have the rock tornado. And all 33 engines lit up. You can even see these amazing Mach diamonds formed and the streams of 33 engines all working in unison to lift this five and a half thousand ton vehicle towards the skies. Now again, if you haven't been living under a rock, you might have seen a bunch of news stories reporting that this mission was a failure. I disagree, this was a vastly more successful mission than the previous flight, therefore it is a success. Most importantly, the mission got through hot staging and successfully separated Starship before the booster failed, and then later Starship failed before reaching orbital velocity. So first of all, let's talk about hot staging. I have resynchronized the telemetry at the bottom of the screen to be in line with what we see on the video. Hot staging is where the second stage lights its engines while the first stage's engines are still firing, and that means that both vehicles continue to experience positive Gs and therefore keep the fuel at the bottom of the tanks. So try and pay attention to the engine diagrams in the bottom corners of the screen. What you see is the booster cuts down to three engines, and those are running at 50% thrust. Then we get the three vacuum engines on the second stage kick in, and this provides enough thrust to weight ratio to push the vehicles apart, allowing the booster to then continue its flip over and relight a number of the engines so it can perform a boost back. Notice, however, that a number of the engines have not relit, and also watch the bottom of the booster, we start to see flashes that appear to be coincident with uh, some of these flashes. There's very clearly problems with the thrust section of this booster, and it's getting worse until eventually the whole booster finally gives up in a catastrophic blast destroying it. So, so at least from the booster's point of view, I think that hot staging looks like it was a success. It's not clear how much testing they did on the hot staging dome, but it looks like it protected the booster because there's no obvious damage, there's no leaks or anything happening from that end of things. So let's rewatch stage separation in slow motion. First of all, it looks like they're shutting down the engines in blocks of five in the two outer rings, and then presumably throttle that core engine down to 50%. As the engines shut down, cold propellant will continue to flow, and that's why we see a much more obvious plume at this point. Also notice that its speed is now decreasing due to gravity losses. And now hot staging happens. The three vacuum engines light first. And this looks spectacular, by the way. Now watch this booster speed, it drops very rapidly here as the pressure from those engines push against the top of the booster. And if we can trust those numbers, that means the booster had negative acceleration and the propellant would have started to slosh forwards. Now at this point, the booster starts to relight all the engines. In fact, you can see them coming on in the booster base. All but one light successfully. Meanwhile, Starship has all its engines lit and it's going off on its own way. But we're going to follow the booster right now. So now you have to ask, why did that one engine fail right now? Is the engine just bad or is it something else? And I suspect that the problem is with the fuel feeding system because we then get one of the three core engines shut down. It never went through a shutdown and restart, but it's now turned off. And I think that the problem is with the propellant feeding the engines. And now more engines are failing. And I think this is either fluid hammer or fuel slosh or a combination of these. So fuel slosh is obviously a problem when you've got a large booster that's doing these big maneuvers. It can cause the fluid to slosh around in the tanks and uncover the ports that are feeding the engines. And if gas gets into the fuel lines feeding those pumps, it will, can destroy the engines. Fluid hammer is an issue with this big rocket because you have many engines moving tons of propellant through the system. And when you shut the engines down, all that propellant has momentum. And that momentum can hit hard on the valves and it can damage the pipes. That's why they shut down the engines five at a time rather than shutting them down all at once. That's what happened on the N1 rocket's fourth flight. They shut down half the engines and destroyed uh, the plumbing. So I think at this point we have serious leaks in the engine bay at this point. The rocket is mortally wounded and the engines are dying one by one as they're either ingesting gas or perhaps fire is damaging something else. So SpaceX are going to have to take a long, hard look at the engine shutdown and relight sequence and, of course, the flip maneuver. 
So the next question is what causes the a booster to actually explode? We see some catastrophic events at the bottom of the booster, but then the actual final event happens from the middle of the booster. SpaceX haven't said anything about activating the flight termination system. The automatic flight termination system wouldn't have activated because the booster was well inside its uh, trajectory. But it is completely plausible that if you have a high energy event in the base that the force can propagate up the downcomer and damage the bulkhead between the fuel and the oxidizer tank, which could then subsequently fail in this manner. Now one thing I did notice was that the engines seemed to fail more on one side than the other, and I wondered was this due to the rotation of the rocket being aligned with those? You know, if there was alignment, that would indicate that the rotation was actually critically important to whatever caused the engine failure. And by carefully watching the video, you can match the engines on the booster to the engines on the telemetry display. And what we see is that actually, no, the rotation does not appear to be lined up with the order of failure of the engines. So I'm hoping we get more information on that. In particular, I'd like to know if SpaceX uh, actually registered a flight termination system activation or if it was uh, an organic event. But moving onwards and downrange, we have Starship. So Starship appear to fly perfectly for the next several minutes. We even hear a terminal guidance call out. That's where it's trying to trim out and find its perfect target orbit. Now the target speed would be about 27,000 kilometers per hour. And as we get really close to that, the spacecraft is low on the horizon and there's a puff of gas and the engine shop, uh, stop and then there's a bigger puff of gas. And at that point, the telemetry freezes and we presume that was the, end, the spacecraft destroying itself. But I think the second stage failure started a little earlier than that. If we rewind to about the seven minute mark, there is this puff of gas and that could be some kind of onboard failure. And I think that it may be related to oxygen getting dumped. So again, if we look at the telemetry and we presume that the telemetry is honest, we have not just the engines, the speed and the altitude, we have a LOX and a CH4 gauge showing how fast the vehicle uh, or how much propellant the vehicle has left. And if we take these and replay the clip faster, you can see the oxygen is always slightly higher than the methane for most of the flight. And then just around the seven minute mark when there's that puff, it visibly drops faster. So that oxygen is going somewhere. It could be going overboard or it could be leaking out of an engine's power head and fueling some kind of fire, which then subsequently turns into something more catastrophic. If we skip forward to a minute later, there's a small puff a couple of seconds before the much larger cloud of gas. And the question is, was that a small catastrophic event which cascaded and destroyed the vehicle? Or was this something that uh, triggered the flight termination system early? It might be that the vehicle just detected that it was had depleted its oxygen and it wasn't going to be able to reach its orbit, so it decided to uh, trigger the termination system to avoid large debris basically cascading over, say, Africa. So where did the debris end up? Well, if we skip forward a little, we can see the camera slowly pans down to the horizon. So we know the spacecraft was at that point not that far above the horizon because it was so far downrange. We estimated it was perhaps 900 to 1,000 kilometers downrange over the Gulf of Mexico. It was 148 kilometers up, moving at 24,000 kilometers per hour, add in the rotation of the Earth, and we get that it sort of probably made it out into the middle of the Atlantic if we assume no atmospheric drag. And Jonathan McDowell came to pretty much the same conclusion, and NOAA weather radar were able to see a long cloud of debris, so the vehicle was destroyed, leading to an uncontrolled re-entry and an extended debris track. And incidentally, NOAA weather radar was also able to detect the debris cloud from the booster falling back over the Gulf of Mexico. There's at least one uh, post on Twitter saying that they saw debris coming down in Puerto Rico. This is not confirmed, but it, it would be consistent with what you might see. And I should probably say that this is downrange from where the debris uh, zones have been designated. But one of the reasons this debris zone narrows is because as it gets further and further downrange, it's going faster and faster and more of a vehicle will be getting burned up before it reaches the surface. So now coming back to stage zero, I've seen plenty of imagery from the ground suggesting that everything looks like it's in pretty good uh, condition. There are a few bits and pieces that were apparently left floating around, big chunks of metal that were thrown, but there was no giant rock tornado this time. 
And moreover, there was no giant steel plates with water spraying out of it thrown around either. That would have been a really bad outcome. Finally, we wanted to know how well the tiles would hold up on this flight, and even in their low-quality live stream that was posted on Twitter, we could actually see holes in the heat shield forming. So even if the second stage had made it to orbit, there's a pretty good chance that it would not have made it back in one piece. So once again, SpaceX is going to have to do an investigation. They're going to have to submit investigation results to the FAA. They can review it, they can agree on mitigations, and then they can launch again. Given that there's less visible effects on the ground this time, I expect that it may be a faster process with fewer agencies having to get involved. And so I look forward to the next one. Until then, it's been a, an excitement delivered kind of day. And honestly, since I got up at 4am, it's time that I took a nap. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.